it feels like academia is like pulling a prank on me. After reading dozens of JSTOR papers, news articles, and Christian websites, as well as multiple books on the subject, I cannot find a single modern theologian or biblical scholar of note that holds to the environmental dominionist position. In fact, that's why I had to coin the term in the first place. There simply aren't any. Even theological Christian dominionists who generally believe that God has mandated a form of government for them to impose onto the U.S., like James Dobson, who you'd expect to support this movement, have declined to present a theological defense of the use of fossil fuels, natural gas, and coal when given the opportunity. Instead, they merely contested that culture war issues were more important than environmental issues, writing, we have observed that Sizik and others are using the global warming controversy to shift the emphasis away from the great moral issues of our time, notably the sanctity of human life, the integrity of marriage, and the teaching of sexual abstinence and morality to our children. The issue, global warming, should be addressed scientifically and not theologically. The only serious defender of the dominionist position I can find on the issue is the former EPA advisor, who is definitely not a religious authority. And neither he nor the Cornwall Alliance even attempt an argument that's ethically permissible for Christians to use pollutants. They just argue that the government doesn't have a God-given right to stop people from using it. I don't even know whether or not to accuse Pepperdine of being wrong to encourage debate on this unsettled issue that is in fact settled, because I don't even know if Pepperdine knows that it's settled. Because Christians certainly don't. According to Dr. Duran, despite environmental dominionism not being a real theological claim, tends to be um, kind of a religious cultural belief that um, dominionism means a sort of a form of anthropocentrism that humans can do whatever they want with the environment. And all of that has to do with I think a practical application of how Christians often, in America at least, American Protestants, tend to see that, um, which is that God gave us this stuff and we get to do with it what we want. And um, while there's not a lot of, I think, strong theological underpinning for that, it tends to be kind of, a, as you put it, a cultural, religious kind of belief that many American Protestants in America have. Um, and I think that's important to understand. It's like. If we're going to be evaluated by how we act, um, then how we behave tends to be in this kind of mode of we get to do whatever we want. As far as I can tell, the scientific literature, links in the description, back up what Dr. Duran has said. Religious beliefs can be a real force for good here if we embrace stewardship and creation here. Let me reiterate, there is not, to my knowledge, a single Christian religious authority anywhere who can or has disputed the arguments in favor of creation care or theological stewardship when it comes to what Christians should do as individuals, churches, communities, or institutions to protect God's creation. Not a single one. So, based on my research, I can say that the ethical implications are clear. The only moral thing to do from the Christian perspective is to limit the usage of oil, natural gas, and coal especially when alternative energy sources are viable, because it pollutes God's creation. It doesn't matter whether or not you believe in climate change. Oil, natural gas, and coal create pollution that harms the environment. That's not up for dispute. And for that reason, Christians must do everything in their power to stop and limit its use. So, what should Pepperdine do? Shouldn't Christians be the first to act um, considering that climate change, anthropogenic climate change, disproportionately impacts the vulnerable, the dispossessed, the poor, uh, women especially, uh, and children as well. And if we believe that Jesus cares for the least of these, then wouldn't we be the first in line to say the science is correct uh, with a couple hundred years of evidence behind that and then you know, sort of marshal into um, certain actions and behaviors and policies that might be dealt with that. The problem is Pepperdine, um, administrators, and particularly the central administration, um, cannot say that climate change is real. But the university doesn't want to admit that climate change is real, and how does that sort of manage 
when you have the Wolsey fire and other fires happening, when you have the, the Malibu beaches eroding and sea level rise happening, um, how do you put those things together? And I find that to be an increasingly difficult position um, to sort of talk about with any kind of integrity, knowing um, that this is what I've given my life to <laughs> working on, and lots of other students are starting to give their lives to working on, and yet there's um, some key administrators who just don't think that this is a real big deal. What about the part of our audience that doesn't believe in climate change? Do you think that even for Christians that have a more human-focused perspective or economic-focused perspective, or they are skeptical or outright reject climate change, that as long as they hold to a Christian ethical framework or any other ethical framework that puts human flourishing and humanity in general as a high good, that they should agree with the argument that we should be moving away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy and water reclamation because it benefits humanity, the environment, the economy, and the world. So it seems to me that Christians should be in the forefront of saying yes to at least clean air, clean water, and nutritionally dense food. And then let's work on solutions that get those to um, everyone, uh, or at least as many as possible, rather than what we find now, which is drinkable water, uh, breathable air, and nutritionally dense food is becoming a, a privileged thing for the wealthy and not for uh, everyone on the planet. So what should Pepperdine do about the fountain? <laughs> um, well, I mean, if, if you're talking about the main fountain in uh, the quad, um, and you got that fountain, you've got a couple, you know, one in front of Smothers and a couple that have, have names attached to them, donors attached to them that I know were not happy when they were turned off. Um, but if we're just talking about that central fountain for a moment, uh, it, it should be turned off. I mean, it, it makes no, there's no moral um, a position you can take that shooting drinkable water into the air during the, la the worst drought in at least a thousand years is somehow morally good like i don't i don't see that whatsoever i, I will take this from a colleague of mine i, I won't name her because i don't have her permission but one of the things that she's advocated for is to transform that area into a native plant restoration zone and to um, sort of use it as oasis is probably too strong of a term but to use it as a place to just plant some native plants instead of all the nonsensical non-native stuff that we plant all over campus that takes a lot of water and to highlight, and she's a Christian, to highlight God's sense of beauty by highlighting what is um, grown in, in the um, Santa Monica region, and what the Chumash people who have lived here for thousands of years have saved as seeds and, and to participate in that. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, I don't know if it's the only idea, but I think that's a great idea. Um, and uh, so those would be my two ideas, with the second one not being mine <laughs> per se. What are some things students can do to better support nature and sustainability efforts here at Pepperdine? I think students forget here on campus how powerful their voice is um, because uh, unlike a lot of other schools where, or larger schools that we compete with whose endowments often subsidize education, here um, students, whether they're on scholarship or not, um, tuition drives predominantly how uh, how successful Seaver College is. So if students were to protest, whether they were to do something on social media, whether they were to do a sit-in or something, their voice matters so much more than the, and it does at a lot of other schools because of the financial commitments that students are, are putting in when they pay for their, their tuition so di directly. Um, vegans and my vegan students and my vegetarian students I think have some legitimate gripes that uh, the vegan and vegetarian program, uh, food choices are very limited and um, I think they, they would love help from more of the carnivorous students to get help on changing that to more climate friendly or at least local uh, farming so I think that would be another one for students to do. Um, but I think you know ultimately that's like all in the perspective of me not just as a professor but as an alum. Are students willing to take positions that are going to be uncomfortable? For those of you interested, we put a couple of links in the description to Pepperdine's sustainability minor, the community garden, and other on-campus environmentalist efforts. And with that, thank you again to Dr. Duran for being such a great guest, and thank you, audience, for watching. This has been Done Censored. Oh, and one more thing. Jim Gash, buddy. Just turn the fountain back off, all right? We're not the Friends cast, people.
You spent all this time arguing about how to interpret the Bible, as if it's some perfect document. It's not, and I'll prove it to you.